in the bulletin, but we're going to be looking at Nehemiah, the eighth chapter. If you want to turn with me, it's on page 762 in your Bible, and I encourage you to open your Bibles as we share God's Word today. We'll be reading from Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. Speaking of God's people Israel, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to, to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. How's your joy factor? You know, that sense that God is with you, as you think about how God has worked in your life, and is working in your life, even this very moment. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. This is a very important time in Israel's history as we read the story of Nehemiah. Um, it's one of the hallmark periods of their life. It, it marks a rebuilding of God's people, a rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, a miracle had taken place. In 52 days, the devastation of Jerusalem that had been totally destroyed. All the walls of the temple were destroyed. The walls of the city Jerusalem, gone. And now God's people come together in a miraculous way. And in 52 days, rebuild the walls and the tower of Jerusalem. It was an amazing event amidst God's people. About 70 years before, um, the southern kingdom of Israel had been devastated by the Babylonians. They thought it would never happen. We talked in Sunday school a little bit. I was blessed to sit in with a little while. We talked about spiritual arrogance. You know, when we take God for granted and we think we're entitled and God owes us and those things, sometimes even God's people, Israel, felt that way. And the prophets had warned them that God loved them and was call, were calling them to repentance and, and faithfulness and all these things, but they would not heed his word. And ultimately the Babylonians came and carried them off. But God was faithful to them and never forgot their prayers. And out of God's love and redemptive plan, he called them to a new day. And through the person of Nehemiah, who was now the governor, he comes and he leads God's people together. It was mir miraculous that they could do anything. It was a wonder that they, they had any strength at all because they had been captive in a foreign land. But now through the, the power of God at work in their life, they did this awesome, amazing thing. In 52 days, uh, young and old, um, people of great skill and people who were just hard workers day and night. For 52 days they labored together and they saw the miraculous re rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Now, after 52 days of working day and night, they were exhausted. <laughs> More than wiped out. Right? Can you imagine 52 days without a day off? Right? 24 hours a day without stopping? Right? Um, and, and, and yet, they were still so awe-inspired at the work of God. They came together. And they stood in the courtyard. The temple was not yet rebuilt. They stood in the courtyard. And, and Nehemiah said to Ezra, Go back in the archives and find the word of God. And he brings it out and he says, And read it to the people. And they stood there for hours. And they heard the word of God read. And it says, as they were awestruck by the word of God, 
um, they began to weep. I've often wondered why they were weeping. Why, why they were so moved. I'm sure there were tears of joy. And there were tears of sorrow. And tears of repentance. And tears of, of wonder of what they were seeing now God doing in their midst. Right? As we come together, think about any particular day when God's people gather together and we pray. All those different reasons that we come and all that we bring before the Lord. For all those reasons and more they were weeping. Right? Um, uh, for, the, for, for many of them, it was the first time they had ever heard the word of God. They had been captive for 70 years. Nehemiah himself had never been to Jerusalem before. It was a miracle that he had come back. He had been, been carried off by his generations before. And now they heard of the word of the Lord and they were moved to tears. Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the high priest, the others, the Levites are looking at the people and they see the movement of God in their life. And the word of the Lord comes to Nehemiah. And God says to Nehemiah, tell the people this. Go and have a party. <coughs> Rejoice. Right? Um, bring, bring your best food. Um, bring your dress, best drinks. Um, come together, call all those that you know together, your family and friends. And for those who don't have anything and aren't prepared, invite them to come and to join you. And then he says this, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. I often thought that was kind of a strange thing to say. It sounds like a good thing to say. But fill in the blank of what he could have said would be their strength. Maybe faithful work. Obedience will be your strength. You know, do what the Lord tells you in every circumstance and you'll be strong. There are many things that could have, that could have been put in that blank of what would have been the resource of their strength and their life, right? And God's presence. But the word of the Lord came to God's people. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And it says, as they began to understand this, as they, as they had been faithful and they had worked hard and, and they saw the wonder of God's miraculous deed in their midst, and as they stood in awe of him, but as they came together, they began to understand, it says, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. But you see, they had lost their joy. They had been carried off. They, 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 they had no sense of who they were and whose they were and the wonder of God, and they had lost their joy in this life. But as they understood the wonder of God's love and grace and mercy and that God was doing a new thing, they rejoiced. And the joy of the Lord, they understood, would be their strength. How's your joy today? How's that factor of joy in your life? Now, it doesn't just say joy will be there. You know, it's good to be happy. Um, there are days that are easier to have joy than not. There are days that are happy days. There are days that are anything less than spiritual or even physical happiness. Joy is a wonder much deeper than just passing happiness. Even though it's wonderful, the Bible talks about blessing and happiness and all those things as well. The joy of the Lord would be their strength. Hear that? Not just joy, not just an abstract idea of happiness, but the power and presence of God who does redemptive things, who hears our prayers and forgives our sins and helps us through the, 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 the difficult times in our life and all those, as the Lord works in our life, even in those joyous moments of abundance and blessing, the joy of the Lord will be our strength. As the Apostle Paul spoke to the church, and he talked about the work of the Holy Spirit, right? God's living presence within and around in God's people, in the life of the church, as God's presence and power show up in our life. Um, the fruit of the Spirit at work is love, joy, peace, patience. It's a whole list of things, right? I don't know that there's a hierarchy. He begins saying that love, right, is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's very hard to love without God's love in our life. You can't give away what you don't have. Right? So love's so important. It's a gift of God's love in our life. But the second thing he said was joy. The gift of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit, is joy. Do, do you know what fruit is spiritually? 
It's excess life. Life overflowing. Um, trees produce fruit. The goal of a tree is not just to survive. Trees are pretty amazing physical things, aren't they? I think of all the things, that they, they, the hottest of days and the coldest of days and, and the northeast, right? We know that, that we go through all kinds of weather events. Trees endure. Uh, but the goal of a tree is not just to endure, particularly a fruit tree. Um, fruit trees, if they're somewhat healthy, right, have some measure of life, um, look very nice, particularly in the spring. Uh, sometimes their blooms don't last very long, but they're, you know, apple trees and cherry trees and trees of everything. I have a flowering peach tree um, out my back door, and when it's in full bloom, it's a beautiful thing to see. But a fruit tree does not exist just to look nice. More than a door, it does, you know, the goal still is not just to look nice. The goal of a fruit tree is to bear fruit. And a tree that has enough nourishment and growth, right, and health and vitality will produce wonderful fruit. And that's what God wants in your life. As his life wells up in you, as God's spirit begins to work in, you, in your life and in the life of the church, out of the abundance of God's goodness in your life, you'll bear fruit. The church will bear fruit. You'll be fruitful and effective in the things that God calls you to do. You won't just make it. The goal of the church is not just to make it, isn't it? Um, I was in a, a conference a number of years ago. A missionary had come to talk with a group of pastors. It actually was called the Nehemiah Project. Um, but he, he was there talking about, you know, the, the goal of the church. And, and he, we had a lot of uh, pastors with, from churches in New England. And they were old, old churches. Long histories. And this pastor had pastored a new church that was starting up in Texas, and they were just a couple years old. And he said, the goal of the church is not to live a long time, even though it's nice to live a long time. The goal of your life is not just to live a long time. The goal of your life is to bear fruit, to live a vibrant life. The fruit, Paul says, of the Spirit is joy. Out of the abundance of God's love and mercy and joy, you begin to receive the joy of the Lord. Right? The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Thank you, Ned, for preaching my sermon earlier because I want to look at Philippians 4. Philippians 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and if you didn't hear me the first time, again, I say rejoice. Now, when you see the prefix RE, right, it means to do again, right? To repeat, right? To, if you have renew something, if you, if you kept your library books out too long, you have to renew them, right? Um, that is true with joy. The Apostle Paul says, rejoice. There's an understanding that life can be hard. Uh, things will be challenging to you. Um, there'll be things that stretch you and, 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 and challenge you. Right? There'll be also things that bring blessing and, and happiness. But in this midst of our lives, if we are not careful, we can lose our joy. I have worked in a counseling service at our church in Bethlehem for many years and many, many times as people were battling depression and facing challenges unexpected in their life, you could see the fact that they had lost joy, a purpose for living, right? And that's a, a desperate time. And yet we would see how God's rejoice, rejoicing and joy would come again. So when we lose our joy, there's an assumption again that joy somehow in the trials of life is taken away from us. Right? And so we need to find that joy again. Right? And then Paul says, in case you didn't hear me the first time, friends, right? You know, you missed it. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Always. Right? And, and then make, he says, make your prayers and your petitions know to God. And, and the God whose peace passes human understanding will restore that joy in your life. Come again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Right? 
As we think about witnessing and drawing people to, to, to Jesus Christ, it's the joy of, the, of our salvation that will be the greatest message that this hurting world can ever hear. Um, people don't want to come to a sad group, do they? To a pe pe group of people that are overwhelmed and discouraged. But where the joy of the Lord is reigning in their life, there's something contagious about it. I believe Jesus was a person of great joy. And as he went from village to town and, and place to place, and people, they saw God's joy, his presence in, their, in his life. And that was the magnetic kind of spirit of God working to draw. It will be true today. The joy of the Lord at work in us will be the strength of our church and of our life. Uh, as praying this morning, as many of you were probably getting up this morning, I was here, and the sun was beginning to shine through this window for the joy that was set before him. That passage comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It speaks of Jesus. For the joy that was set before him, if you read that passage, it says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You think of a cross, that doesn't sound like a very joyous thing to me at all. Um, in fact, it's the, the taking on the, the sin of the world, the, the, the cruelty of his day, to bear the, the, the agony of a cross, that's joyous? Oh no. For the joy that was set before him, he was willing to do that. And I want you to understand that the joy that was before him was you. The joy that brought, brought Jesus to the cross was to think that you and I and people like us would come to know him and our lives would be changed and that the world would be changed through the work of his spirit. And I believe that Jesus rejoices as he sees us in worship and working together and, and our lives are beginning to live for him. For the joy that was set before him, you, he was willing to go to the cross. And I believe that the Lord rejoices with us as we go through these moments together as people. These are exciting days for your church. I hope you'll invite me back again sometime years from now and, and I'll hear the wonderful God stories of what God has done through Pastor Brock and through your life as you serve the Lord together. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, if you didn't hear me the first time, I'll say it again. Rejoice in the Lord for the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us to enjoy this wonderful life that you've given to us. We are a blessed people in so many ways. But Lord, we don't want to come just with a sense when days are good, we praise you, and then we run the other way when life does not go the way we want. Lord, help us to know that strength that comes from your living spirit that abides within our hearts and minds. Lord, we pray that your joy would be our strength this day. So when we are wearied and tired like your people Israel so long ago after they had worked so hard, Lord, we pray that your joy again would come and that we would know the wonder of who you are. Lord, may our joy come to us today like it's the first day that we were ever forgiven. The first day that we were ever loved by you. The first day that we ever realized that we were special and cherished by the heart of God. And so, Lord, may the joy of the Lord be the strength of this people, we pray. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.